I think experiential learning is scalable. If you manage to inspire students, build learning spaces, and build communities that allow students to excel. Now, I like to tinker. On weekends like this, you find me on my boat with my friends, putzing around, fixing things, painting, uh, running wires. That's the kind of fun I'm getting, I get into on the weekends. Now, in 2011, when I joined the residential team of the University Scholars Program at the National University of Singapore, I had the opportunity of a lifetime for a tinkerer. I got a startup teaching grant to start my teaching in the college of $5,000 and unusually without many strings attached. So I could spend it on whatever I like, just show the receipts and they get reimbursed. So I got the students to think what would be the most fun project you could do with $5,000. So we thought, okay, um, why don't we buy a scrap motorcycle and turn it into an electric vehicle. So here's our motorcycle. Can we turn this into electric? Yeah. Here is the students, Shreyas, Aloysius, Brian. They got Jörg Weigel involved from the Innovation and Design Program at the Faculty of Engineering. We stripped the motorcycle to its skeleton and started to work. Now, here you see the students designing battery mounts uh, running wires, putting the batteries together. The students actually know the theory behind all of this. What is needed often in our universities is the practical skills. And that's where experiential learning comes in. We let the students play and discover for themselves what it takes to turn a machine, in this case, into an electric vehicle. They know their wire gauges, they calculate the wire gauges, but how to run the wire through the frame? Well, that requires um, play, it requires experimentation. You need to be able to fail, and you need to be able to figure it out. And that happens when you have an experienced mentor, such as Jörg Weigel at hand. After many hours, here it is, our electric vehicle, uh, proudly showing off the team, proudly showing off the vehicle. Does it actually work? Oh yeah, it rides really well. Does it, can it go long distance? Well, let's put it on the ultimate endurance test. Let's take it to Switzerland on the world's largest electric vehicle rally, the wave rally. Here we pack it up, ship it to Switzerland, and here are the students, Yang Shen, environmental engineering student who wrote her thesis on the conversion of motorcycles into electric vehicles. We have the student riders, Ayush and Rastas, ready to get going. And here we are riding through the Swiss Alps on a course of 1,500 kilometers, ending up in Luzerne Lake on a meadow overlooking the lake at the final goal of the rally. All right, we thought, that was on the road. Can we go on water too? Okay, here's the sailing boat. Unfortunately, it has a combustion engine in order to get in, go in and out of the harbor. Can we turn this boat into a carbon neutral vessel? Now that is a challenge for engineering students, mechanical engineering in this case, to build a truss to hold solar panels that can be mounted on the boat and can power an electric drivetrain. The students designed the truss and the student knows his, um, his connecting techniques, how to uh, connect metal to metal, but he has never seen a welder actually weld stainless steel. So these projects often become mini internships where the students learn the practical skills that complement their theoretical knowledge. We have the student, uh, Eric, in his mini internship, and we have Nav mounting the solar panels on the truss. We got an electric motor, we built a battery, put it, on, put it all on the vessel, and here we have our carbon neutral vessel. Does it work? Well, here is the maiden voyage of Singapore's first and only carbon neutral motorized vessel. All right, 
That was good. We did the road, we did the water. Can we go in the air? All right. Here's Jörg Weigel challenging his students from the Innovation and Design Center program to build a human carrying drone. <laughs> wow. That's a challenge for a group of engineering students. Are they up for that? Well, here's the design 18 propellers, a seat for one single person. And here is the team building this machine. Now, what happens in these projects is that you need to experiment. You need to try and fail. You need to analyze your failure, go back to the drawing board. So this cycle requires a safe learning space, supervised by, well, an experienced engineer who can tell you where to go, who can give you these hints. The students start to learn from each other. And soon enough, they put all the materials together into the final product, in this case, 1,450 pieces. The final product assembled here and showing off uh, in this picture. That's a nice picture, but will it fly? Oh, yeah. We found the lightest USP student, Xiao <laughs> <laughs> uh, Wen, uh, for, uh, forming as the, uh, uh, um, posing as the passenger. And up she is going into the air. Now, this was the first human carrying drone back then. So we got quite a bit of uh, publicity out of this, as you can imagine. And we had invited to the Founders Forum in London, where we had a really interested visitor, uh, Prince William. He himself, he is a uh, helicopter pilot. So he was fascinated by our project and got a, led us to take this picture. <laughs> It's really nice of him. All right, so um, we got a bit of a reputation. So the National Geographic Channel approached us and said, OK, can you build us a flying car for a show? We give you $10,000 in three months. OK, does this pass as a car? They said, sure. Can you make it fly? All right, we'll try. Here we are, the team of students. Uh, in our uh, safe learning space. And what is interesting in these projects is that communities of learners spontaneously form. They start learning from each other, and they, these projects tend to, out, tend to bring out the best in the engineers. So they all contribute, and before you know it, you have your flying car. Isn't it a beauty? Can it fly? Oh, yeah. Here it takes off starts to fly and soars. All right. So those are the kinds of projects that form indelible memories for the students involved. And the challenge that we have in the innovation and design program is to continuously come up with projects that inspire our students. I myself, I'm not an engineer. I'm a computer scientist. And around the same time, 2011, when we started to tinker with our motorcycle, I got the opportunity of a lifetime for an educator. An experiential course for programming freshmen became orphaned in the School of Computing. No one wanted to teach it anymore. And here, that was my opportunity to get into experiential learning in my home faculty, the School of Computing. Now, experiential learning is a natural fit for teaching programming because you need to learn how to solve problems using a computer. It doesn't really matter what these problems are, right? So you might as well choose problems that the students can identify with, that they inspired with, fun projects. So we get a lot into computer graphics. We let them program sound. We let them build robots and program them. But nevertheless, programming for students who have never touched software can be a daunting task. So how to bridge that gap from seeing how the teacher solves the problem to being able to solve such problems independently yourself. That is the gap that we need to bridge when we do experiential learning. And we do that by forming extremely small classrooms, groups of eight that we call studios, led by a slightly more senior student that we lovingly call Avenger. So we have Avengers facilitating these learning sessions. And that's a safe learning space 
where the students are allowed to fail. They're allowed to experiment, they're allowed to uh, practice, analyze their failure, see what went wrong, try again and go in a cycle. And soon enough, they get the courage, they get the confidence that they themselves, just like the Avenger, can solve problems using the computer by computer programming. Now, I started the module when I had 40 students in 2011. Little did I know that in a space of seven years, this course would grow to 412 last semester. You may ask, how can this scale? If we have tiny classrooms like this, we insist that we have only eight students. Where should all these Avengers come from? Well, I can tell you how it works. On day one, in the first lesson of the course, we tell our students that if you do well in this course, you can become an Avenger. The Avengers are the lifeblood of the module. You remember that me telling the students, right? We had an award-giving ceremony for the Avengers in the first class. We, the students not only feel obliged to come back as Avengers, no, they aspire to become Avengers next year. So uh, it is possible for us to scale experiential learning when we manage to build a community of learners. So here's our team from last semester. We had 50 Avengers, 54 Avengers. And uh, the Avengers themselves, they form, they form a community of learners. It's a class it's by itself. And our class is about how to keep improving, how to keep improving our experiential learning for our freshmen. We form little groups that we call clusters. And within the clusters, you have experiential learning happening again, this time about teaching, about facilitating the learning. In the last four weeks, I interviewed 117 students from last semester, freshmen, in order to become Avengers next semester. And the vast majority of our top students applied and, and came and want to come back as Avengers next semester. The students come back not only to help us in our teaching, they come back to improve and build our teaching tools. And here's our Source Academy, which is actually a virtual spaceship that our students developed that helps us teach the students. It's actually in, in a programming environment, a web-based programming environment that immerses the student in a spaceship. So the students have their own dorm rooms and uh, they, uh, lots of uh, adventures happen in the spaceship. They get to explore a, an alien planet, solve quests, and so on. If the student doesn't like a feature of one of those, of, of the Source Academy, I tell them, you're welcome to come back next semester and help improve it. And that means we continuously improve our own tools. Now, that is something special that we can do in computer science. We can uh, build our own tools. We can apply our skill directly for the next generation of students. We can do that in, in engineering. We can do it in computer science. But how to scale that beyond disciplines? Here is an idea. How to scale experiential learning beyond disciplines? Why don't we take a real learning space and put it in a vessel and take students on a journey of exploration, a multidisciplinary journey of exploration? So I asked Captain Warren Blake, can we use your ship in order to do experiential learning? He says, sure, come on board. Yeah, the, our students learning how to navigate a ship, and again, a safe learning space develops where the students go on a journey of learning uh, throughout the neighboring archipelago. Depending on which part of the university organizes these voyages, they take different shapes, and the students learn different things. Here's the uh, special program in science conducting biology experiments on the voyage on the marine environments that we visit. We have the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences studying the economics of the island communities that we visit, the culture of the communities. Uh, depending on who organizes the voyage, we have astronomy, we have ge geography, and 
um, ecology uh, explorations. In the last two years, we conducted 14 experiential learning voyages on board of this ship. Uh, we took 150 students on board, 25 uh, alumni came, and we explored the islands in the region, the Riau Islands province, our neighboring islands, from the Anambas Islands to, to Batam Bintan, all the way down to Sinkep and Linga. We visited Sumatra, Java, Krakatoa, Borneo. We went to Langkawi and Phuket uh, on experiential learning voyages uh, for units around the campus. So uh, today, universities actually compete with online learning methods. And I think experiential learning is an asset that we have. Universities know this. So we, as teachers, we get more and more flexibility. Sometimes even students get encouraged to design your own module. And that's an opportunity for you. You can design your own experiential learning voyage for you and for your fellow students. Of course, there are challenges. Where does the funding come from? There isn't everywhere $5,000 laying around, but you'd be surprised. If you put your mind to it, you can raise funds. You can also cut corners. On this ship, for example, it's bare bones. We reduce the cost by basically camping for, for our 10 days voyage throughout. So you can re reduce the cost. You can overcome the administrative challenges that you're facing. You can overcome legitimate safety concerns if you put your mind to it. But if you want to scale your experiential learning, you need to continuously develop inspiring project ideas. You need to create safe learning spaces. And you need to build sustained communities of learners. Thank you.